In this talk, in the next, we're going to explore memory, uh, particularly in terms of how the types of data that we define, uh, primitive data, arrays, things like that, are set out within memory. And we'll look a little bit about how, given a variable name, we can map that onto a particular location and address within memory. Um, now, a lot of this is, is quite fundamental stuff, quite introductory stuff, and a lot of it you, you'll know to one degree or another. So I'm going to go through it quickly. There, there's a few key aspects that I want to, to tease out, um, if you like salient points that are important to, to have a clear understanding of. And a lot of this is foundational. Um, we'll build upon it, um, particularly later on. But it's a useful mindset, point of view, uh, to, to be able to adopt whenever we think about how the programs we write get to be structured, set out within memory, get to be executed. Um, not much to say here, I mean, we're all familiar with the notion of memory. In essence, it, it's, it's a store uh, that we can store not only our data associated with the programs, but ultimately we have to store the actual machine instructions themselves. So that's, that's where they, they, they sit, that's where they live notionally. Um, memory, as we all know, is divided into a number of locations. Generally, we're storing bytes, or a byte in each particular location. And given a particular uh, location, a numerical address, we can look that up and we can get the, the contents, the ones and the zeros which are stored in that particular um, byte of memory. Um, for the data that we store, and here we're thinking about primitive data, but this, this scales up to, uh, to, to user data defined through classes, because there it's going to be most likely a composite of a number of other data items, and ultimately you'll get down to primitive data um, in the end. But if we're thinking here of just storing a single piece of primitive data, well then it will start at a certain location in memory, and the type of the primitive data, if it's an int or a char or a double or a long long or things like that, will determine how many bytes uh, that we need to process from the start location to be able to read in, if you like, the full uh, piece of primitive data. The type of data also tells us how we should be interpreting those ones and zeros that we're reading in. Think back to last talk, we mentioned that in terms of our primitive data in C++, we have uh, both integer types and floating point types. Uh, so again, depending on the type, we know how to interpret our ones and our zeros. Um, so fair enough, that's, that's what we want to understand at that high level about uh, memory. So here's an example here, a uh, very simple one. Over the left-hand side, towards the top, we've got an int counter and we've got a double total. So we're defining two items of primitive data, an int and a double. Um, down towards the bottom, we're, we're showing a, a section, a segment of our memory store. And uh, this is likely to be somewhere on, on, on the stack or wherever we're going to be storing these. So we have int counter first of all. Now, the way to, to visualize this, to think about it, is that whenever we have the name counter or variable, counter effectively is associated with a particular address in memory. And if you follow the line going from counter, it goes down to, well, index 5 in our, our memory store. So counter effectively points to that address in memory. That's what counter is associated with. It's an address. It's a pointer to an address in memory. We just happen to call that particular pointer to that particular address, counter. That's the name we give to it. The int um, type associated with counter tells us how many bytes, in this case four, in most cases in C++, we need to read from that particular location to read in that integer. So you can see notionally we're reserving from byte five, six, seven, and eight. They're the bytes we um, uh, will we'll reserve, will set aside, will associate with our counter variable. The integer type also tells us how we should process those ones and zeros. Ultimately, this is ones and zeros is what we have stored here. So we need to know how to process those ones and zero, if it's signed, if it's unsigned, if it's floating point, if it's not. And that will enable us then to actually construct the precise value that that counter has in this case. For our double total, so again, uh, you can follow the line, the arrow through here, and it starts at location 9. So we're assuming it's located just after counter inside memory. Uh, double is 8 bytes in size. So we're assuming then that those 8 bytes will be reserved 
for the exclusive access associated with total. And because we know it's a, a double point or a floating point representation, we know how to interpret those ones and zeros across those eight bytes to get the particular double uh, number that we have um, uh, to deal with. So again, fairly straightforward, but that, that in essence is, is how we take um, sort of a contiguous store of ones and zeros and start chopping it up into meaningful chunks that we can then process and use at a slightly higher level. So from collection of ones and zeros into, in this case, a way of segmenting integers and doubles. And again, we can build up and up and up uh, within our programs. So variables can be viewed as having type and location. Fair enough. Modifying a variable modifies the memory pointed to by that variable. So if we were to modify or counter or something like that, in essence, we are going to the address associated with that. We're looking at the number of bytes we have across and we're manipulating the ones and zeros in those particular bytes. It's straightforward, it's reasonably obvious, but it is um, that being able to visualize and to think about your program in terms of, of how things are set out in memory and the types of manipulation that you're doing quite often is a useful um, ability to have. Certainly if you want to think about performance or if you're doing, it's working at a low level and you want to do something more complex by way of how we manipulate uh, these pieces of data. Arrays in memory then, this I suppose is the next step up where we're going from not simply storing one piece of primitive data but to storing a whole sequence of them, an array of them. And again it's reasonably straightforward. So. In this case here, we're uh, looking at a, an array called data. It's of type int, and we are reserving four ints within that particular array. So int data four is what we have. Key thing to this is that any time we create an array, um, if it's traditional, just normal array, it will be created as a single uh, continuous segment of memory. So we will reserve a chunk of memory sufficient to hold all of the values within that array. So down at the very bottom you can see how we can do this for our int data 4. So int, let's assume it's 4 bytes uh, per int. We have 4 of them, so 16 bytes need to be set aside and reserved um, to store that particular array. And you see down at the bottom, notionally the first 4 we associate with data 0, the second four with data one, then the data two and data three, uh, stepping through in, in chunks of four. So creating that array will reserve that section of memory, and we're going to notionally uh, view those different regions as holding the, the data zero, data one, data two, data three. Now in terms of access to this, so if you have an array, you need a way of being able to look up um, a particular value within that array, so array index two or 300 or whatever it's going to be. So this then gets into, well, how, given a credit array of memory, how do we work out which address in memory we should be reading from if we're interested in a specific, uh, a particular element within that array? Thankfully, it's quite straightforward, it's nice and easy, and actually involves a little bit of calculation. So anytime we do an array lookup, a small calculation is performed in the background that calculates the address at which we will find the piece of data that we're interested in. And you can see the equation over here is in bold over on the right-hand side. If we want to access it, it's the address of the first element, and we're adding on to that the array index times the size of each array element itself. So we'll break this down. Um, bit in the middle says that for each array, there's a number of core pieces of information. So if we are creating an array, what we will have available to us is the type of data that we have stored within that array, and we'll know the size of that piece of data, uh, if it's an int in this case, four bytes, and we'll know the number of values that we have uh, within the array. We'll also know the start location of the array in memory. So down at the bottom, we've got int data four, same as before, and in line two, we're saying that data two is equal to one. So we want to be able to determine the location of data two. We want to do it fast and efficiently, so we want to calculate it directly. So how do we do that? Data itself is the actual name of the array. We know the start location of data, where that array commences. So we can go there, that's data zero. So that's the address of the first element. And on to that, we're adding, again, back to our bold equation, the specified array index, in this case it's two, times the size of each array element, in this case four bytes. 
So we will go to the start of the array and we'll add on 2 times 4, 8 bytes. So that is the location. Notionally, the start of the array, jump forward 8 bytes. We now have calculated the location in memory of data 2 in this particular case. So small calculation gives us a way then of jumping to a particular location within the array. And any time we do an array index or lookup, that's a calculation that will be carried out. Thankfully, that type of calculation also scales up to multi-dimensional arrays. Uh, so here we have an example of a char array called dat uh, of 3 times 4, um, so 3 rows, 4 columns. And over in the right hand side you can see how we have set that out in memory. Again, importantly, uh, whenever we're creating this, in this case multi-dimensional array, a single contiguous chunk of memory will be created. One block of memory will be created to hold all, in this case, 12 different char values. And it's structured, again, as you can see in the right hand side, where we have all of our data 0, then data 1, and then data 2. And inside our data zeros, we go through the 0, 1, 2, 3 sub-elements within those. Now, the nice thing about doing that is that we can use exactly the same type of equation that we had on the previous slide. That in working out the memory address given, uh, in this case, an i and a j, uh, sort of a first and a second, or a row or a column index, it's the, taking the start location, it's multiplying it by uh, whatever row index we have times the size of the row, and then adding on to that the column index times the size of each element within the column. So again, you can use exactly the same approach to calculate the precise location in memory of the uh, particular element that you're interested in. Rows for two dimensions, scales up to three, to four, to whatever number of dimensionality you want to have uh, within your array. And again, array lookups will have this happening in the background in terms of enabling us to access uh, that data. Um, again, as it breaks it down there, you can see uh, location of data 0, data 1, data 2. Uh, if we know this, we can then step inside those for working out the elements of the, the different bits. When we're looking at pointers, this is going to be important because with pointers, we, we can point to a location in memory. By changing it, we can jump and move through that particular uh, array-like structure. Heap and stack, we're going to finish off with this. It's, it's only one slide. Now, here it is here. It's an important one, however, because this is, is key to how programs are executed. And we'll, we'll return to this quite often whenever we're thinking about the execution of a program. If you think about it, uh, memory is just memory. It's ones and zeros. It's a store. Nothing more than that. And inside memory, we have to store everything of use. So that includes data, that's most obviously what we think about, but it also includes the instructions, the program instructions, the machine instructions that will be read and executed on the, the CPU to perform to execute the program that we are running. So whenever we create a program, generally speaking, you'll get a chunk of memory. And there's um, what you see here is fairly common across most programming languages in terms of how we um, separate out memory within that particular chunk. So you can see over in the left hand side uh, we have a part of memory that is reserved for holding machine instructions, for executable instructions. That's where it is there. So all of the machine instructions that define what it is our program actually does, that's whereabouts they're stored in memory. And after that we're going to have then the program data, mostly within the heap in the stack. Now, a little aside, a lot of the attempts to hack programs, normally the heap in the stacks where your data lives uh, and that's where you're, you're sort of manipulating things. Um, a, a lot of the, the, I suppose the things you want to guard against are, are programs that try to write uh, where they actually go in and they modify the bytes within the code section will actually change the instructions then that gets to be executed. So you can hijack code, um, get it to do different things by, by, by doing that. But start of the program, we have the machine instructions. That defines, if you like, the algorithm, the execution of our program. After that, in, in particular to, to C++, we have a region that's set aside for holding any static variables. And we're going to return to that um, whenever we're looking at objects. So static variables are, are you know, anything declared to be static always exists, irrespective of anything else within your program. So you think of these also as global variables. So they always, always exist, always defined. And generally speaking, we don't want to use any static variables or global data. So 
Um, really, we shouldn't be using this area. But there's reason to set aside there for holding those. Now, after that is where all of the action happens in terms of data. We have a big chunk of free memory, which is surrounded on one side by the heap and on the other side by the stack. And the heap and the stack, they will grow and shrink as your program executes. Uh, generally speaking, the heap is where we store instantiated object, objects which will live for a good amount of time normally. So it's dynamically allocated memory, particularly within C++. If we create a new something, it gets to live on the heap. Within Java, within C Sharp, any time we create objects, they're automatically stored in the heap. So that's, that's mainly the, the main area for, for Java and C Sharp as well. C++, using the new keyword, that's where we're allocating our memory um, at. On the stack, they're used for, you can see here, automatic variables. That's things like local variables or function parameters if you're calling a method. So it's short-lived data. It's data that you may want to create passing in as a method parameter, or if you're calling a method and you're creating an int a counter within it, it has to live somewhere, but it's all short-lived, or that's the assumption. So they normally live in the stack. As we add things, the stack goes down, shrinks, or gets lower in terms of address, and the heap increases. And ultimately, the bit in the middle is the free memory. And you can see what happens that if you keep declaring and creating and adding things, eventually the heap and the stack will come together. All of the free memory will disappear. At that point, you'll have an out of memory exception if you try to create any more. That's where the program will fall over. That's also how um, recursion comes into it. So if you have an infinite loop that's calling a method, you'll keep adding things to the stack and it'll keep on growing and growing and growing until eventually it collides with the heap. And again, you'll have an out of of, uh, of memory exception. So this slide's important because this gets into how memory is structured and it's it's a managed process within languages like Java. We don't need to worry about it too much but we should understand this is what happens. In C++ we will have more control over this. We will be able to choose where we allocate and store memory if it's on the heap, if it's on the stack. Uh, it will also be our responsibility to free up memory whenever we're finished with it. So C++ is a lower level language, makes this management process a little bit more explicit. But it's worthwhile um, going through that, that extra effort, just so we understand cleanly and clearly what is happening, uh, if you like, under the surface in terms of how our data is set out and how it's managed. That's all we want to do within this particular one. We'll, we'll build upon this in the next one. We look a little bit more at, uh, at, at memory. Um, key takeaways in this. So understanding how data is stored and arranged in memory is, is key to writing efficient programs. It really is. C++, it comes down to primarily to thinking about the heap and the stack and understanding how these will grow, how they will shrink, how we can best manage data that we create on them. There are different costs associated with allocating memory. Generally, it's, it's more expensive to allocate and deallocate memory on the heap than it is on the stack. It's very quick and cheap to allocate and deallocate memory on the, the stack. Uh, your understanding how data is stored will be important when we look at dynamic memory allocation, but we'll, we'll get onto that in June course.